it seems like what your work is finding is that a lot of our lifestyle and diet related problems that are driving blood sugar dysregulation and mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammation, our ultra processed diet and sedentary lifestyle, all these things that sort of accelerate the problem yeah. actually exactly. make like, these sort of neurotransmitter problems worse downstream. Mm -hmm. And you can treat the neurotransmitters or you can treat the cause, right? Yeah. You can treat the symptom or you can treat the cause. And I think the metabolic psychiatry approach, you know, I, like you said, has many tools, like metformin is a drug that helps improve it. But there are many other things, right, that mm -hmm. are including diet, lifestyle, exercise, we know is very effective for mental health. And how does that work? It may partly work by improving insulin sensitivity, right? Yeah, that's one. And, yeah. you know, increasing BD BDNF, which you and I talked about last yeah. time, I think yeah. on your show, like now five years ago, the yeah. time has flown. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you 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 described it as miracle grow. And I really love the way you described yeah. it. Yeah, because yeah. It's, exactly, it's exactly what it is. Yeah. That was one, you know, with exercise, that is, it's shown to you know improve those levels. And improve cognition and so forth. So there's a lot of tools. And the mitochondrial therapies, I mean, uh, you know, there's a woman named Suzanne Go who's um, looked at a lot of uh, mitochondrial dysfunction autistic brains. And mm -hmm. whether you have ADD or autism or you have Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or depression or bipolar, schizophrenia, it's all this spectrum of brain dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And and the there's a lot of common pathways involved in all these. Yeah. And, and her work has found that, yeah, there's energy deficits in these kids in the brain, just like, and it may show up in one, subset of people has autism and other subset is schizophrenia but mm -hmm. essentially it's the same mechanism you know she talks about using mitochondrial therapies essentially cofactors that are involved in these metabolic steps these biochemical steps require helpers and so they use nutrients like amino acids or coq10 or other compounds uh, that actually help improve brain function so i wonder are you are you exploring any of these sort of nutraceutical approaches that are using the body's own things that uses to actually make energy, but giving them a, a sort of a higher doses or through supplementation as a, as a tool for helping metabolic psychiatry patients? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. And I, I love her work, by the way. And I think looking at mitochondrial dysfunction, it's a, a lot of shared mechanisms with these different conditions. Um, so it, it does make sense when we're studying uh, serious mental illness and other conditions to be looking at vitamins, cofactors, um, things. So we test for that in our clinic. We test for um, all of these things and we optimize. Um, so we we have an approach that we use to make sure that people are not deficient in, right. these, in these things. Because if someone's deficient, does that make sense right. <laughs> to treat them only with medication and right. ignore the fact that they're right. deficient or malnourished in some way? If they have insulin resistance, obesity, or metabolic syndrome, sure, let's treat that. But let's make sure they're also not malnourished. Most yeah. of them are malnourished. Yeah. And you mentioned 90-something percent of the population is having some kind of metabolic abnormality. They're overfed and undernourished. Right, yeah. Too so many calories, not enough nutrients, yeah. It's almost like a crime to not to not uh, be thinking about it. And I that's why I think it's really important uh, to have that approach and to answer your question, while I'm not specifically looking at one supplement and its effect on psychiatric outcomes, mm. I'm really looking at um, the whole kind of the whole picture and making sure they're optimized. Um, give an example of research that's been done um, in our field by colleagues who looked at omega three supplementation, um, at least one gram, including EPA per day, yeah. um, for. I think it was a total of eight to twelve weeks period, yeah. um, which significantly uh, had a good. It was modest uh, evidence that showed benefit for uh, psychosis, uh, early phase schizophrenia, early phase um, psychosis, and it's also been a treatment as an adjunctive treatment for depression. Things like this are helpful. Um, yeah. for us to know about. It unfortunately didn't have the same effect for chronic schizophrenia, yeah. uh, but that's why prevention is so important. And mentioned earlier about fasting insulin, right, and development of depression, like why aren't we checking these things more routinely or more frequently to prevent conditions or prevent exacerbation of, you know, symptoms that are so severe like psychosis? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what you, you're bringing up is important. And, and, and you know, medicine's very reductionist. And like, so let's look at omega-3s. Let's look at vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Let's look at magnesium. Let's look at whatever yeah. B vitamins. And, and the body is so complex that it requires 
all the ingredients. And it's like if you want to grow a healthy plant, you can't just have soil. You need water, water and light, yeah. you know, and vice yeah. versa. Yeah. Like the human body is very much the same way. And I think we we often will not be sophisticated in how we think about providing all the components needed for optimal function of mitochondria, of your immune system, of uh, insulin resistance. And and I think that one way to navigate that is sort of emerging from our understanding of met- metabolomics and proteomics mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and gene expression products that are helping us understand the body in a more nuanced way. Yeah. And I, I think one of the things I think a lot about is what are the biomarkers of mental illness? Mm-hmm. And what are the things we should be looking at that that can play a role rather than just treating one thing you have to find everything that's off and fix it in other words if mm-hmm. your omega-3 is low and you take it great but if your vitamin d and magnesium are also low might not work as well right yeah yep. and so you kind of have to think holistically about all the various factors so can you talk a little bit about your work in the frame of of the biomarkers of mental illness and what you're thinking about in terms of evaluating that, you know, you talk about lipids and triglycerides and HDL and blood sugar and anyone seen all that, but yeah. it goes deeper than that. It does, and I, I'm glad you're pointing that out about the, um, you know, optimization can't just be um, a reductionist approach of one thing. We really have to look at at everything, and and that's what we are doing with our treatment approaches. It is important to, you know, obviously monitor those things as well, but biomarkers are biomarkers. They're in psychiatry, I don't believe that there's just going to be one biomarker. Um, it's going to no. be, it's a group of uh, markers and thinking about certain metabolic disease states, uh, certain conditions, uh, how much the progression is based on those biomarkers is is really where I think uh, we're heading. And also part of the effort in our uh, trial, we're starting a randomized controlled trial generously funded by uh, some philanthropists, including Peace Guard Philanthropies um, at Stanford. And we're looking at mechanistic approaches uh, for a metabolic intervention like a ketogenic diet um, Mm -hmm. in schizophrenia, bipolar, and depression. And we're looking at a lot of these biomarkers. I'll give you one example, um, and that is looking at triglyceride HDL ratio, for example. Um, That's been something that has been shown um, with a lot of good data mm-hmm. that depression's severity and chronicity is uh, associated with that marker. And so. that's directly related to insulin resistance. So the mm-hmm. higher you get higher triglycerides, the lower HDL, and the ratio becomes higher as you get more insulin resistant. So it should be like one to one, right. and then you can go yeah. two to one, four to one, ten to one. And yeah. you know, if if your blood, if your triglycerides are one fifteen, your HDL is thirty. That's a five to one ratio that's not good what was interesting about that study is that insulin sensitivity wasn't associated with the chronicity of depression but it was for the severity but the triglyceride hdl ratio was associated with both so it there are some interesting nuances um, in the literature about about kind of looking at the biomarkers uh, a little bit differently and um, i think there's there's a lot of different biomarkers that will be helpful um, in, in even, for example, with insulin resistance, since we're talking about that, when we look at insulin resistance, we see that even with bipolar disorder, you have more rapid cycling, you have more treatment resistance, um, and you have more suicidality. So that's another thing that we could use as a biomarker as well. Yeah, I think it's, it's so many different things. I mean, I when I think about it, it's, you want to check your nutrient levels that affect mental health, like vitamin D and homocysteine and methylmonic acid and Mm -hmm. omega-3 fats and omega-3 index and hormonal effects like thyroid and sex hormones and Mm -hmm. your iron levels and zinc levels and insulin insulin measurements and some resistance scores, which are now available through Quest, which we do at Function Health, which measures C-peptide and insulin with mass spectrometry, which is a really accurate way of measuring some resistance and triglyceride mm-hmm. HDL ratio and particle size and particle number, mm-hmm. inflammation levels, CRP. So all these things are blood tests that, that actually can help clue you into many different problems. But yeah. but actually, if you see there's abnormalities, and we see a lot of it, like with functional health, we're seeing like 70% have a nutritional deficiency at the uh-huh. minimum level that's actually yeah. recommended by the dietary. Not surprised. You know, so it's like, <laughs> not like what's an optimal level Unfortunately. of vitamin D or what an optimal yeah. level of homocysteine is, but like homocysteine levels are in the lab up to 14 or 15 and should be probably 
you know, six to eight that measures your yeah. folate or B12 or B6 status. And so we're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing, you know, 95% with metabolic dysfunction through the yeah. lipid particle size. And we're seeing 46% with high CRPs. And we're seeing a lot of really significant inflammation. So we started to go, wow, the population is at, the lar- at large is sick. We're seeing an increase in mental illness. And no one's really talked mm-hmm. about how do we how do we think differently about treating things systemically and i think your 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 what you said is really important because it's a paradigm shift from thinking of the body as a bunch of different organs and parts to how the body's a network and everything is connected and that we have to treat the network not the symptom exactly and, yeah and so that's a lot of what your work is doing and i wonder also the schizophrenia part you know 17 percent of People with schizophrenia have elevated gluten antibodies, which can drive a lot of brain inflammation and create a lot of neuropsychiatric symptoms. Absolutely. And, yeah. and again, you're taking that out when you give people a keto diet. That may be part of it, you know. It's a good thing that we should test before and after too, which we're doing in our next study. So yeah. we will be doing that. Um and, and also looking at looking at gluten antibodies? Yeah, we're planning to. Amazing. Yeah. Just looking at uh, mitochondrial deficits too. So yeah. we'll be we'll be looking at that. So how are you doing that? Because it's it's something in medicine we you know we don't really pay attention to. We learn about mitochondria in the first year of medical school. We learn about the Krebs cycle, you call the TCA cycle, which is the energy cycle, how you turn food and oxygen into energy in the body. And then we kind of forget about it. And it's not part of clinical medicine. We don't talk about how do we evaluate mitochondria, how do we test them, Mm -hmm. how do we treat dysfunctional mitochondria. Yet it's one of the central features of most illnesses that are chronic, from mental health to neuropsychiatric disorders to metabolic disease like diabetes to heart failure. Many, many problems are mitochondrial issues. Yeah, I don't have an answer as to why we don't do it more, but I think it's, uh, you know, something that is probably difficult and hard to to treat in some ways. But the more research I think that we have in this area, the better it's going to be for more targeted interventions. Um, so I'm hopeful, you know, for that. One thing that I thought would be helpful in when you're describing the mitochondrial dysfunction and various conditions, what we are um, seeing in, in psychiatry also is that, you know, the brain is volume-wise, it makes up 2% of our body, but it consumes 20% of our energy. And it's so delicate, extremely delicate, that if there are deficits in insulin and glucose handling and that, you know, Krebs cycle machinery um, to produce energy, then there's more metabolic vulnerability in psychiatric conditions. There's more metabolic vulnerability in specific areas of the brain. You and I talking right now, we're maybe using 80%, you know, of our capacity. We have, if we're, you know, talking a little bit more deeper in science, you know, it'll be a 5% increase. Um, our daily, you know, activity is a bit less. And for someone that maybe has genetic predispositions or um, have environmental stress, it's going to be a little harder to have that, you know, perfect machinery producing energy. Mm. Um, And there's more metabolic vulnerability there. And so those differences between one region of the brain and another is, is pretty critical for functioning, cognition, mood, and mental health symptoms. And, and how are you thinking about measuring mitochondrial function as you're talking about in your, in your upcoming studies? I believe in a lot of collaboration. I love collaborating with other scientists. So University of Toronto, Mayo Clinic, um, a lot of other departments at Stanford. I have a faculty member, chair of genetics, who at Stanford will be looking at all omic profiling, so all expression of proteomics, metabolomic data, uh, wearable HRV data. Another uh, faculty member is going to be looking at ketone metabolites because downstream of ketone metabolism, there may be, say, an amino acid called phenylalanine attached to uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is what ketones will break down into. Yeah. Um, and if you have that, the end effect of appetite reduction or weight loss is present. If not, it doesn't work as well. The mitochondrial testing is a collaboration with Mayo Clinic and University of Toronto, and that's looking at all the different metabolites in the mitochondria. Lactate's one of them, but there are a lot of other, there's succinyl-CoA, different dehydrogenases, so we'll be looking at all the all the levels of that. But it's not something you normally can get at a regular lab test. No. Is there a research-based test looking at mitochondria? Yeah. I mean, clinically, yeah. it's been a, a tough thing for us to look at because you could do a VO2 max test, which is basically an exercise treadmill test that measures yeah. sort of indirectly your mitochondria. You can measure organic acids, which are urinary metabolites. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, we all have sort of subtle changes in our metabolic pathways that affect 
different things. And yeah. we can see some of those changes. But there's now, you know, cheek swabs that look at the respiratory chain, which is, you know, basically the assembly line that turns food and oxygen into energy. And there's some interesting, you know, kind of ways to start to think about how do we sort of clinically measure this in people? Because it's such a big, it's such a big black box and it's so important. Yeah. And then you can actually even be specific and say, oh, this pathway that requires CoQ10 is a little slow. Mm -hmm. So what if I give extra CoQ10? It's exactly. going to speed it up. And right? it becomes more personalized that way, right? Like And more specific. And I forgot to mention, we're also looking at epigenetic data. So looking at DNA methylation and gene expression, it's 120 patients, randomized control trial, and we'll be collecting a lot of data, continuous ketone monitoring. Mm -hmm. Abbott donated the devices. Um, the so glucose monitoring. Grateful for that. Yeah, glucose monitoring and getting more. We're still fundraising for the trial, but we have gotten enough to get started and we're looking at all these measures and it's exciting. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here.